we will discuss in this session uh, certain concepts of classical mechanics which you should be familiar with. Uh, most of the concepts are typically taught in the undergraduate uh, courses in classical mechanics. <coughs> the most important concept that we need to start with is the law of motion. So, we will simply assume that we know about the law of inertia. The law was originally given by Galileo and later mentioned as the first law in Newton's Principia Mathematica. The law of inertia states that an object, if not subjected to force from outside, I mean external force of any kind, then we continue to move with constant speed along a straight line or it will remain static forever. Uh, we know that. Okay. No, no surprise there. The next important law is the law of causality or also often called the law of force. This law is uh, straightforward. It establishes the causal connection between force applied on an object and the acceleration of that object. The precise statement of the law, it says the mass times acceleration, a provided mass is not a function of time, should be equal to the applied force. And it's a vector law. So, I mean, both sides are vector. Or in more general word, this can be mentioned as the rate of change of momentum of that object is equal to the external force. The third important law that we need to know is the law of reciprocity. This says, for example, you have um, two objects. The first object, we are assuming this to be a point particle. It's exerting some force on two, let's say, an attractive pull. We call this force F21. If first object applies the force on the second, then it feels, in turn, an equal and opposite reaction force. So we can denote that by F212. The law of reciprocity simply says that F12 should be F21 with a negative sign. So magnitudes are equal, the directions are exactly opposite of each other. One consequence of this law of reciprocity is the conservation of total momentum if only forces which are happening with the object 1 and object 2 are internal forces, just like we discuss here. In such cases, the rate of change of momentum of the first object, which is equal to F12, and the rate of moment, change of momentum of the second object, which is equal to F21, their sum simply gives you zero, which means the total momentum is conserved for such a system. So, law of reciprocity uh, help establish that with the law of causality. In a simple way, there are other ways of showing the same thing. There is one more law, although not every textbook mentions that to be a law, but we will take it to be a law. So for example, it's called um, law of superposition. This was proposed as a law by Bernoulli, who mentioned that uh, if you have an object on which 
there are multiple forces acting like F1 and F2, two forces, then the net force is given by the vector addition of the individual forces. We almost take it for granted, but remember this uh, should be mentioned because uh, in your more advanced courses, one needs to look at whether the principle of superposition is strictly valid or not and where. So in this case it is valid, we take it that it works and it is a law. So these are the basic laws that we are assuming you to be familiar with. A consequence or you know there are many consequences of these laws, so some of the consequences important one are uh, the conservations, conservation of energy, conservation of linear momentum, conservation of angular momentum. Um, we will look at the conservation of energy, particularly in the context of work and energy theorem. So let's have a, a look at it. We do not need this statement, so we go back to the work energy theorem. We would like to particularly establish how this theorem connects the conservation of energy. These are also called work energy relations. To establish or to derive these relations, we designate an incremental change or incremental uh, amount of work done. It's a small amount. Incremental, this is infinitesimal. Okay. It's a very tiny change. And this infinitesimal work done is defined to be force acting on an object times a dot product of the infinitesimal displacement of that object. I'm talking about single objects here, but if we have collection of objects, then there should be a sum where we need to find out force acting on each object and take the dot product with the infinitesimal displacement of each object. Let's suppose for simplicity, it's a single object. Now, from Newton's law, the law of causality we have, the force is nothing but the rate of change of momentum. And the infinitesimal displacement could be written as uh, simply because the v vector is nothing but dr dt. So we can write dr as v dt. But then if mass is uh, not a function of time, then we can write this momentum. We can write it in this form. Using these definitions, we can go back to writing dw as Just a little bit of algebra and this will give you here the p square is simply the dot product of p's. Now this is kinetic energy. So what we get finally the infinitesimal work done is equal to the infinitesimal change in the kinetic energy. Now, this is very important result. Or you can also write it in terms of time derivative. The rate of change of work done is equal to the rate of change of kinetic energy. So uh, the statement of this entire thing is if you have an object, you push it, you apply some force, you do some work. If you do some work on that object, then the object, its momentum increases. 
its kinetic energy increases and this work done and the kinetic energy are simply related. If you do some amount of work done, exactly that amount of kinetic energy will be increased for the lab. So this is one result that we keep in mind. Now, we can also look at uh, the infinitesimal change in the work in terms of the potential energy. So, we start with the very same definition with which we started earlier. But this time, let us suppose we can get the force from uh, negative gradient of potential. Uh, this too, you know, I mean, it's a, a familiar concept. And this negative gradient, we will use another shorthand notation instead of writing writing this del or nabla operator, we will write it like, uh, I mean, this is given by I caps del del x plus G caps del del y plus K caps del del z. Where I caps, J caps and K caps are unit vectors along x, y, z coordinates, axis, and these are partial derivatives along x, along y, along z. We will use another shorthand notation to write this as del of del R vector. I remember, it's just a notation. So using this notation, we would like to write, using this notation and this, that infinitesimal chain in the work is equal to this expression. You know, some gradient of potential negative sign and this dot product with infinitesimal displacement. Now suppose we are considering a conservative system in which the potential is only function of position. It's not a function of time, it's not a function of class. In that case, an infinitesimal change in the potential can be written in terms of the gradient and del or our operator del v del r. But then this expression we have in the expression of dw. So dw turns out to be minus dv or in terms of derivative. So, infinitesimal change in work is equal to the negative of infinitesimal change in the potential energy. On the other hand, uh, in terms of rate of change, the rate of change of work done is equal to negative rate of change of the potential energy. Now, these two expressions can certainly be combined. After all, you can see that these time derivatives are kind of equal. So, finally what we get from these two expressions is the total amount of potential energy and the kinetic energy. The rate of change is Z. So, this is the statement of conservation of energy. How do we get this? I mean, look at the fragments of argument. We assume the force to be a potential force. So force, the expression of force can be obtained from the potential by taking a derivative. This is crucial. So that means it is the potential which is causing the force. So as a result, any work done by the force results in some change of potential. So if we think that way, then we don't need the work at all. I mean, we can only talk about the kinetic energy and potential energy. After all, you can also equate these two relations and you can say that 
rate of change of kinetic energy is equal to negative rate of change of potential energy. So it is more like when a system evolves under some potential, the kinetic energy is getting converted to potential energy or potential energy getting converted to kinetic energy such that the total remains constant. Let's look at a very simple example where this is happening. A simple example, as a simple example, we can just choose the string mass system where let's say we have a string and here is a mass. In a string mass system, if you push the mass towards this side or straight it out and leave it, it will oscillate. And assuming there is no dissipation of whatsoever, then this oscillation will continue forever. Okay. Assuming this is point mass, we can also so this is this is the zero displacement. This is let's say this position along the x-axis. This is the maximum displacement, and this is the minimum displacement. Then you know when the mass moves from mean or equilibrium or zero displacement position to the maximum, the furthest out. During this motion, the force, a Hookean force, is basically the distorting force which is acting towards this direction. It's trying to bring the mass back to the main position. So which means the forces along this direction and displacement is uh, outward towards positive x. So the work done is negative. If the work done is negative, so that means net change in work, this is basically negative. And what about then the change in potential? We just found that delta v should be negative of delta w. In this case, as such, this is positive. So when the mass reaches there, the change in potential is positive. And we know when it stops, it only has potential energy, a positive potential energy. Now, what happens? What about the kinetic energy? Well, the kinetic energy was maximum here. As it goes there, it loses kinetic energy completely. So you can get rid of the you know work and you can say that the kinetic energy got converted to potential energy and when it comes back to the middle the potential energy got converted to kinetic energy. So uh, we do not talk about work much if it is a potential uh, if it is a, if the force is a potential force derivable from a potential energy then. We simply talk about kinetic energy and potential energy. But remember, I mean, it is always, you know, the relations were established by assuming how much work is being done. So this concludes the discussion on the work energy relations.